Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our webinar participants from around the globe. Welcome to this DevEx webinar sponsored by Research for Community Access Partnership, or RECAP. This is a six-year program that supports research into low-volume rural roads and transport services in Africa and Asia, funded by a grant from the UK government through the Department for International Development. RECAP aims to strengthen the evidence base on more cost-effective and reliable low-volume road and transport services, thereby influencing policy and practice. It works on a portfolio of research, capacity building, and knowledge management initiatives in partnership with new and existing national research centers and local partners. Today's webinar is entitled Research to Practice, Engaging Local Communities in the Future of Transportation. My name is Helen Morgan, Editorial Associate at DevEx, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar topic is an important one. We're going to talk about how we can better engage local communities in rural road and transport research. There's an increasing need to conduct research around rural roads and transport services in Africa and Asia to learn more about how we integrate the perspectives, attitudes, and knowledge of the people affected by transportation plans. Research about the planning, construction, and maintenance of rural roads and transport services really must incorporate the opinions, knowledge, skills, and perspectives of local populations to support suitable and sustainable solutions. To discuss this important matter in more detail, we're joined today by three outstanding panelists who have extensive experience in the road and transport sector. After their presentations, we'll have plenty of time for our speakers to answer your questions. Our lineup of speakers today is as follows. Tony Greening, Independent Transport Research Consultant with TRL. Gina Porter, Senior Research Fellow at Durham University. And Caroline Barber, Head of Pro Programs at TransAid. We're delighted to be able to draw on their expertise during today's webinar. After the presentations, we'll allow plenty of time for Q&A, and so you'll be able to enter your questions using the questions tab or chat box in the ReadyTalk window. Feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar. We'll be keeping track of your questions, and we'll try to get to as many as time allows. If you do have any technical problems during the webinar, please note that although I won't be able to deal with them myself, uh, just send a message through the chat box, and one of my colleagues will assist you. During the webinar, we'll be live tweeting from at DevEx. Our Twitter hashtag for this and other DevEx webinars is hashtag DevWebinar. So if you want to interact with others listening to this webinar, then just use this hashtag. Again, that's hashtag DevWebinar. We'll be looking out for your tweets and retweeting them. So do join the conversation online. I'd now like to hand it over to our first speaker, Tony Greening, who will kick off our presentation. Tony, thanks for joining us. Perhaps I could begin by just asking you to give us an overview on the current state of rural road and transport research. Thank you very much, Helen. <clears throat> Good morning, afternoon, and evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. Um, my presentation this morning, this afternoon, is just to um, just to give a brief overview of what's happened in uh, in um, transport research in developing countries in. Um, over the last uh, uh, 10, maybe 15 years or so. Um, so maybe I'll begin by just reminding ourselves that there are still um, a number of problems that exist. And this slide was actually taken from a World Bank presentation a few years ago uh, to remind ourselves that many problems still exist. And this is just uh, a short um, uh, uh, two examples. 1.2 billion of the world's poor are still lack uh, access to an all-weather road. 40 to 60 percent of people in lower-income countries live more than eight kilometers from the health care facility, and although that doesn't sound so much, this eight kilometers can involve very difficult terrain, as in places like Ethiopia, and many people still live far, far greater distances from the health care facility. People in rural areas can walk 20 kilometers or more to an all-weather road. In terms of road safety, over 3,000 people die from road traffic injuries a day. 85% of these are in developing countries. 
and 90% of injuries occur in low and middle income countries. So over 70% of those in Africa still remain unpaid. So research is required to provide cost effective solutions to these and many similar problems in the transport sector that impact on rural communities. I need to some just a few pictorial examples of access in that they, they affect all road users. So you see that I, the point I wanted to make from those four brief pictures is that there are both social and, and economic um, impacts from poor access. And while economists might say to us, well, it doesn't really matter if a rural road is shut for the day, if you are, as in the first slide I showed there on those pictures, if you were the people with a young child who, was, um, who maybe got malaria, then being delayed access to a health center for just a few hours can make a huge difference and can be really worrying. So what was the situation of research in lower income countries? And why do we need to do something about it? Well, in terms of local petitioners, these are the people who are most knowledgeable about local problems and local communities too, of course. They are more than aware because they are the people who are impacted uh, from uh, poor access. But these are also the people who are best suited to find appropriate solutions. The situation, unfortunately, in the past in developing countries in, is that although many countries have been independent from colonial rule for more than 50 years, yet many still rely on expatriate inputs for research to find solutions to transport problems in rural communities. This situation is clearly not sustainable. The problem is that there are constraints on research and research knowledge. Research is seen as a luxury by many politicians. In the past, research reports were in hard copy and difficult to access, making updating them costly and infrequent. Designs and specifications for roads were based on traffic, materials, and environment in developed countries. And although they were modified to some extent, uh, for, um, uh, for developing countries, um, they were still very inappropriate. Those are constructed, of course, to strict designs and specifications. Contractors and consultants adhere strictly to these uh, designs and specifications because the consequences if something goes wrong when they've deviated from them can be very serious for them. Infrequent revision of design manuals constrained implementation of beneficial research outcomes because of this infrequent updating and, and, and the reluctance for some uh, uh, consultants or contractors to, uh, to adopt these measures. Then it, it led to uh, uh, serious constraints on the implementation of research. And just to remind ourselves why research is important, it's the mechanism for the advancement of knowledge and growth. It provides opportunities to test new ideas and to develop innovative solutions, which can very often make a huge difference uh, to rural access. Countries that invested heavily in research have grown economically. That is, there is a relationship between research, investment, and growth. And you've only got to look at some of the countries where in my youth, and I'm quite an elderly guy now, in my youth, we're very backward, very, very undeveloped. Some of these countries who have invested in research have made enormous progress in terms of um, their economic um, standpoint in the world. Developing countries' investment in research, including in the transport sector, is often zero. And this is very, very disappointing after such a long time. And just to give some examples of the potential benefits of research, TRL back in the mid-1990s was under pressure to actually show that there were some benefits for research. And the annual benefits of just 12 projects was 15 times the annual cost of all TRL projects, which at the time were over 400, being undertaken in the base year. And another paper given by uh, Bly to the Institute of Civil Engineers in 1996 stated that the estimated road and development benefits in the UK were that for every million pounds invested, 
the benefits to society were 20 million pounds annually. So there are significant benefits from investment in research. And what are the potential impacts of local research centers? This is why local research, I believe, is, is, is so essential. But of course, there's advancement of knowledge as there always is from research. Develop of new ideas and innovative solutions, as I mentioned earlier. But perhaps far more importantly is they, they provide local solutions. There's also uh, opportunities, which is many of which have been undertaken under the current WECAP program, is calibrating research-based evidence from elsewhere. That is learning from neighboring countries where perhaps have, have invested in research. And then calibrating uh, those uh, outcomes to, um, to, to benefit the local population. And longer term research projects tend to give the biggest benefits. And although research has been done in terms of, uh, in terms of projects, there has been no sustainable investment very often. And when projects come to an end, that's the end of that research and there's no follow-up follow research. And it's the longer term projects that often give the biggest benefits. And of course, there is, if you invest in a research center, there's a better chance for sustainable research. There is always has been a problem with putting research into practice. There is an inevitable resistance to change. People do not like change. People are much more comfortable in uh, existing uh, procedures. There has been political apathy, there's no doubt. There's inappropriate focus on risk sometimes too. Engineers are naturally um, adverse to risk because the consequences uh, can be serious if they get things wrong. There's a resistance to new technologies, or it has been. And there is always very little incent um, incentive for change. So what are the solutions? Well, perhaps greater consultation with all stakeholders. And I mean everybody involved, from the research, the local researchers right through to communities. So that people feel that research can't help them. Ownership by stakeholders and, and greater, perhaps greater involvement in the planning of research projects. Demonstration projects that show the potential benefits are very important and can be undertaken by research centers. And consultant and contractor training, perhaps, also on me, because it's already, it's, it's all right, it's, it's okay to have workshops and it's important to have workshops and training courses and whatever, but actually what really gives the confidence for contractors and consultants to use the outcomes from research is to actually demonstrate that they, that they actually um, uh, are beneficial and, and, and training as, on the problems in, that inevitably arise when uh, they undertake uh, new technologies. And lastly, design manuals. This is very, very important. As I said earlier, roads are built according to very, very strict designs and specifications. So getting the research into design manuals is very, very important. And this is a major um, component of WECAP and is likely to have a major impact in the implementation of past research uh, outcomes. So there has been a change in approach to rural roads in recent years, which, is, which has, has helped research. There's a greater appreciation by politicians that the road network is an important national asset. The timely maintenance of these roads are really vital. Roads don't fail tomorrow if you don't maintain them today, but they fail, they will. Dedicated funds for maintenance have been set up by, by establishment of road funds. There's been a different approach to the life cycle costing of rural roads, which allows us to look at them in the same way as a as an investment in higher order roads. Many of the, many of the uh, results of research has enabled us to upgrade roads from gravel to paved roads at lower traffic levels, a lower traffic threshold for upgrading. There's been the development of various forms of low cost servicing technology which allows us to give sealed roads at reduced cost. And in all this is helping to help the provision of local transport services. If roads are better, transporters are far also far more likely to provide the transport services which are so desperately needed for local communities. And far more importantly than all these, perhaps, is the increased acceptance of the need for developing a local research capacity. So things are changing, things are improving. So what have been some recent impacts? 
The new COP government projects such as CCAP in Southeast Asia, AFCAP, the African Community Access Program, um, and RECAP now, which incorporates a, the second phase of AFCAP and a component for, for, for ASCAP, which is the Asian Community Access Program. Research and demonstration projects are taking place under these programs, which show local practitioners what can be done to, to benefit local communities. Design manuals and specifications are now in digitized form, which makes it much easier to upgrade to, to include uh, the results of, of research and, and continually update these, uh, these documents. Training and workshop in research and best practices also have been undertaken under VCAP. Increased consultation with local practitioners and communities is now taking place. And as I said uh, before, reports in electronic format and internet access make all this knowledge that's been developed to research much more accessible. I just want to give then a couple of examples to finish <coughs> on the possible uh, impacts of, um, of, of research. I was involved back in the 1980s, I think it was, on, the, um, on, 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 uh, on uh, research that had been undertaken by TRL and uh, funded by the British government on, uh, in Botswana. And this, was, this is a before and after um, um, photographs of the Trans Kalahari Highway. And the important thing about this particular project, I should acknowledge if Mike Pennard is listening that he provides me these photographs, um, the, the road before was the one on the left, and none of the materials available locally for the construction of that road met the existing specifications at the time. So research was carried out uh, by the Rose Department in Botswana with the help from TRL to actually study uh, um, the performance of some local materials and from the, those results of that research, uh, it was possible to use these materials. And the estimated savings producing the road shown on the right was around 20 million US dollars. Finally, uh, I just want to show this, this slide because this is a road that was uh, constructed quite recently in, uh, in northern Ethiopia, uh, in, which one point, in, in which three kilometers of, uh, of road was constructed um, through a village. There was an existing gravel road which was extremely dusty. And in fact, the houses on one side of the road, which were below road level, were at the end of the road uh, of the dry season, were completely covered in dust. And clearly there is, a, there is an issue in terms of uh, uh, local pedestrians being exposed uh, to the effects of dust, particularly children. And here you see, I don't know if you can see in the, in the background, the children walking to school with the road safety officer in the front there who's, who's actually conducting traffic. Traffic on this road is actually quite high. So the biggest, the biggest benefit that the local people keep on telling us is that is that the, the, the amount of dust generated now is, is, is very, very little, of course, because the road is sealed. And this is using um, uh, a, um, a low-cost seal, which was developed in Scandinavia, called the Otter Seal. And it enables us to use weaker aggregates, weaker stone, which is available locally. That's the point, it's available locally. And these are just a couple of examples of how research can, can bring down the cost and improve um, opportunities um, for improved access for local communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, for that great overview. Um, we'll go straight into our second presentation with Gina Porter now from uh, Durham University. Gina, over to you. Thanks, Helen, and good day, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about various research methodologies that can be used to bring communities really into the process of um, building new transport services in particular, but generally in improving transportation. So um, I'm going to focus on users, and particularly people who are really disadvantaged, women, children, older people, infirm people very often, very often have very little access to transport services, may have none at all. 
and I'm going to talk about three different uh, uh, methods, approaches to, to sort of uh, engage with people uh, in those communities. So participatory action research where you actually make an intervention and then monitor what happens, mobile interviews, and finally co-investigation where um, we can work with people as, as equal joint members in uh, a research endeavor. So um, I start then with participatory action research. And this is a study um, I did some years ago with Ghana's Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, we worked in five off-road villages in coastal Ghana and wanted to try to find out whether intermediate means of transport might improve women's market access, but what other impacts that intervention would also have. So what we did was to start with a year of collecting data, observing what, how, pe how people in those villages accessed or weren't able to access transport, and in particular women. Then with Ministry of Agriculture support, we took six different IMTs into each of those villages and people were able to buy them on credit, on reasonable credit, but women were given first option. And then we had two research assistants sitting between these five villages for 20 months and looking at what those 70 adopters actually did with the transport, those IMTs, and how it uh, impacted on their wider lives. But we also had a matched control group so we could compare uh, those adopters with people whose lives just continued as normal. And it was really interesting how much we learned from this exercise because often IMT is introduced, it fails, but people then just go away. By exploring uh, through this very careful monitoring, we found out, for instance, that it was only families with children who could help uh, use, operate the equipment. Um, that's what actually, that's when they were happening. Um, and that people, when we asked women beforehand what sort of equipment they'd like, they'd mentioned certain things, but when it came to buying the equipment, they went for something else. So that's participatory action research. And the key features then are the intervention experiment and uh, then following through. And obviously the great advantage is that you can compare what people say they're going to do or what they might do if they had certain things with actual patterns of adoption and use. But the limitation is how long it takes um, and finding that matched, suitably matched control group. Um, so that's participatory action research. Another um, approach that I think is very useful in beginning to understand community access needs and transport needs are mobile interviews. Uh, we had uh, a major study with children, looking at children's transport and mobility in Ghana, Malawi, and South Africa, 24 research sites, and we found that walking with children was really, really important in learning about their transport needs and experiences. Often they were very shy, and they couldn't talk easily face-to-face -face with adult researchers. And of course, there were always parents listening and, and so on. So if you went for a walk to the well or to school or whatever, you learned a lot. Um, so mobile interviews then of this sort can be used not just with children, but they can be used with other groups of people. They don't need to be just used uh, as walking journeys. You can use them on uh, if you're traveling with somebody. Um, it's a good way of getting rapport with interviewees, particularly where the interviewee and the person interviewing are very different in terms of their power uh, and uh, their, their place in, 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 um, in the world. You get a lot of insights into journey constraints and benefits, but again, it's the time and the cost of doing this kind of work. 
there may be ethical issues. You've got to be very careful if you're walking with children, for instance, or traveling with children, that you've got parental consents and so on, as well as the child's consent. And, you know, that if you have a male member walking with a female uh, child, there may be issues around that sort of thing. Older people also may not easily walk long distances. Moving on then to the third method, which is the one I want to spend more time talking about. This is co-investigation and using co-investigation as uh, a base for, a, for uh, then extensive academic research as a subsequent phase. We, again, we use this in that 24 site study with young people in Ghana, Malawi, South Africa. We recruited 70 uh, young people as co-researchers. They were 11 to 19 year old school children. We gave them a week's training workshop. They did, we had two of these in each country and the children selected what methods they were going to use, where they were going to do their research, the time scale and so on. But then we used that information to help build the key questions for our checklist interviews for the qualitative research which followed and for a major survey. And then this is where we really built on what uh, the, the, key, the key points that they had raised and key questions. So the point is then that when you've got commonly excluded groups like children, it's very difficult for them to start to express their views. Very often they're not expected to speak um, and yet, they do often have complex mobility needs. And if you use a co-research approach, then you will get a much clearer view of those needs and experiences. Um, and it can be a very, very productive route into, uh, into community understanding. Um, we've used that subsequently. We've, we've done uh, another major study, same 24 research sites, um, but this time looking at the relationship between mobility, transport, and what mobile phones mean and how they connect, and that's been very, very useful. Uh, and here again, some of, the, it's some of those child researchers we trained in 2006 who are still working with us because they see uh, the importance of this work and we really value their contribution. We've also used it in an ASCAP study of older people's mobility. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that because here we only trained 12 older people, but um, we gave them a week's workshop and we had support from HelpAge who were um, uh, the, the co the also collaborators in this study. and. Uh, again, it was extremely useful in understanding key issues for older people's mobility and access. This was in Tanzania. Um, and the older people learned all sorts of simple techniques and then they decided which ones they would use. Uh, we didn't use mobile interviews because they decided that those didn't really work. What older people working with older people trying to understand what's going on because long journeys were, were hard work. Um, but seasonal calendars, timelines, using disposable cameras, and so on. And just a few um, pictures here, and you say so you can see um, people in the workshop um, practicing different uh, approaches, learning about interview techniques, and so on. Uh, and then at the final workshop in Dar es Salaam where our older people, our peer researchers, were actually able to, t to talk about their uh, evidence um, and even engage with the Minister for Health. So co-investigation uh, is it's this method where you're recruiting community members as co-researchers and you, use, you, you learn from them so that you can then build a much larger study which they may not be able to uh, spend the time uh, to, 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 to do, um, but building then quantitative as well as qualitative research from their key questions. 
really you get unique community access you get novel insights uh, insights and you can help to redress power imbalances the issue is again time the skill that inputs you need for the initial training there are ethical issues you've got to think very carefully about you really in this case you really do need intensive support um, throughout to your peer researchers um, and think about the interactions with other stakeholders. But finally, just to sort of wrap up more broadly on participatory research approaches and engaging communities, I think there are massive advantages to be gained, particularly when you're working with vulnerable groups. You get deeper participation, you do get stronger project ownership, and you do get good data quality. But you have to think about the time and the cost for the participants as well as the researchers. You've got to think about ethical issues. You do have to really understand the power, the politics, the culture, the history of the communities where you're working. And of course, even despite you can build all this knowledge, but transport professionals may still continue to exclude those voices. And you've got to think how much you are able to actually do. Outcomes are crucial. So will you be able to deal with any negative outcomes? Will you be able to ensure that community voices do really resonate through and reach the people they need to, to reach? And thinking just about our own biases as researchers always as well is very important. Thank you. Thanks, Gina, for that very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to Caroline Barber from Transaid uh, to give us a bit of uh, your perspective as an implementer. So how does this type of research play itself out on the ground? Caroline, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Caroline Barber. Um, I'm coming from an organization called TransAid, and it's a, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to share some experiences with you all today. And thanks very much to Gina and Tony for those really interesting presentations. So I would like to, um, to take a moment to, to share with you as um, Helen introduced, some of the, the practitioner perspectives, I suppose. Um, my presentation is entitled Implications of Community Partic Participation in Road Projects. And um, I must say before I start that this presentation was actually intended to be delivered by um, TransAid Zambia Project Manager, Victor Simfukwe. Um, unfortunately, he was unable to be with us today, so um, we've prepared this presentation together. Um, and it's a shame he can't be with us, but hopefully we'll, we'll share the key messages. So moving to my, um, my first slide, I wanted to start, I think this presentation builds nicely from, um, from the foundation, the background that Tony has given, and then the detail that Jean has gone into. For a community engagement approach, the key considerations, there are some key considerations that we need to bear in mind. First of all, programs that aim to improve access for people living in rural communities need to invest. They need to take the time and create the space to understand the key issues on the ground. And as part of this, it's vital to understand the local context. And this really includes starting by looking at the current availability of transport services. And, and that's sort of TransAid's key consideration, really, and especially in a rural context. As Tony mentioned, the community themselves are really best placed to articulate what their transport needs are. And they may look very different to what an imposed perception of what those transport needs might be. We've also found it's really important to to not only talk to communities and the users of transport, but traditional leaders as well, who can play a really critical role in opening up um, transport services if they're brought on board as part of the discussion. We find that communities can offer advice and feedback on what needs to be strengthened, what transport, for example, might be suitable for the terrain, what could be maintained locally, and very importantly, what is culturally appropriate. So in summary, without the involvement of the community, from a practitioner perspective, I do strongly believe that programs are likely to be unsuitable, unsustainable, and a high risk of failure if we neglect the actual users of the transport themselves. 
So what I would like to do is to take a case study, which is a program that um, we've been running for a couple of years now in Zambia, um, and we're just actually wrapping up at the moment. Um, the program is called More Mamas, um, Mamas Standing for Mobilizing Access Maternal Health Services in Zambia. And I think both the previous presenters both highlighted this, um, this issue that uh, any delays, um, any barriers in access can have devastating consequences if, for example, as Tony mentioned, you're living far from a health facility, if the transport isn't available, and, and what do you do in an emergency situation? Um, so that's really what we were focusing on in this program, um, which was responding to suddenly high um, maternal mortality rates in rural Zambia um, and looking at how we could bridge the referral gap. So we're really focusing on the community to the first level um, health center, which was otherwise quite a neglected area um, of focus in the referral chain. So this photograph is show, um, showing a group of um, SMAGs, which stands for Safe Motherhood Action Groups, um, who are volunteers within the community taking charge of their own health, um, working through a uh, community empowerment and community engagement approach. Oops, sorry, just jumped the slide there. So the background um, to this program. Essentially, there are a number of barriers which were there to, um, were there to accessing health facilities. And in rural Zambia, transport is often expensive. Um, it's often limited in availability. Terrain itself can be challenged. There's a, um, a photograph on the right here, um, you can see on your slides, which is taken from Western Province, um, from in Mongu, showing the deep um, sand. Currently, many women actually in labor walk, um, or they use makeshift stretchers, or they are pushed um, on a bicycle. And importantly, some women are actually discouraged from tra traveling at all to a health facility due to a lack of transport. So it might be unavailable, it might be expensive, or it might be such a perceived barrier or an actual barrier that women don't travel at all to a health facility. Okay, still in the context of Zambia, um, most people in rural Zambia are living far from a health um, centers. Delays can work, worsen the clinical severity of cases, particularly where complications exist. And there's plenty of global evidence suggesting that implementing transport strategies alongside other interventions may contribute um, to a high percentage. A Murray and Pearson study in 2006 suggested an 80% reduction in maternal deaths. So what strategy does the More Mammoths program take? It was really a partnership approach. Um, the program is actually um, funded by Comic Relief, um, a UK donor, and it's implemented in a consortium of, um, which has a number of members. Um, there are two international and two local um, partners in the consortium. So our local partners, a Zambian organization called Disicare, who are a group entirely run um, by people with physical disabilities who construct mobility aids. Um, we have a group called Development Data who, um, who are registered and running um, their operation in, in Zambia and Zimbabwe, and they're looking at the monitoring and evaluation aspects. We also have our partners, Health Partners International, um, and then, of course, there's TransAid. We work in partnership with the Ministry of Health and closely with our communities. Okay, I think it's jumped to slide there. Apologies for that. Okay, so the approach was a close collaboration with the district health management teams as part of the Ministry of Health and a comprehensive design work at the community level. And this is really, I think, what we're zoning in on here today, to make sure the time was spent at the start of the program to understand the issues, to look at distance, to look at the terrain, to look at the socio-cultural and economic context, um, and speak to the communities about their perceptions of all of these, to talk about what type of transport might be appropriate, what accessibility there would be in rural areas for spare parts, etc. And these findings then informed the emergency transport scheme, with the ETS as we called it, design, and ensured that the program built on what was already in place and wasn't just picking up a solution from elsewhere and trying to impose it. So we used an approach um, of intermediate modes of transport um, to respond and to try and improve to rural communities' physical access to health facilities. So this involved 102 bicycle ambulances that were constructed locally um, and 18 ox carts and 36 oxen, which were, the ox carts were also produced um, locally um, in the district of Mongu 
and the oxen were also sourced again from within the communities as well. So just to show you a couple of photographs, um, this is the bicycle ambulance. So we have um, a robust bicycle made by World Bicycle Relief, they're also built um, within Zambia. And this is the trailer the, um, that pulls behind the bicycle as well. Now, of course, it's not the, the fastest means of transport, but what we were looking at here is talking to the communities, working where there was already an existing bicycle structure, where people were comfortable to ride bicycles, where they were comfortable with maintaining bicycles, um, and were able to, to work with this stretcher, um, with this trailer that would go on the back um, and, and pull behind to cover the distances. Again, we're talking about the first mile um, from the community level where there may not be any transport at all and certainly not available 24-7, which was another major barrier. In Western province, um, bicycles were in many of the areas less suitable. Um, there's deeper sand in many areas and there's a high local preference for using ox carts. So what we've got a photograph here is two volunteer ETS, emergency transport scheme um, riders who are walking and leading out here with the um, ox cart. And this is actually um, a situation where there was a mother inside um, who's on her way to a health facility. And again, it may not be, it may just challenge a little bit the perception of emergency transport. But if in areas where motorized vehicles cannot get through um, or where simply motorized transport may not be available, where there may not be funds um, there for the, the fuel um, and the maintenance and those ongoing costs. This is something that can bridge the gap. And it's, it's only really successful because of the community ownership of this means of transport, where the riders are there, where there's a system for accessing them, where, where people will move click quickly, where women um, and their husbands um, know how to access the means of transport. Where, where possible, there's a communication system in place to call ahead to the health facility. So it's not just the physical hardware of putting the IMTs in place. It works because of the community engagement and buy into the process. And if we don't start by asking for people's suggestions of what would work, why it would work, um, what kind of ground clearance do we need, um, what modifications, if it's for emergency transport or if it's specific to an area, need to be made to work work with local artisans because we also don't want to be putting anybody out of business who are also working in these areas. So moving on to the next phase, just a little bit about how it works, just briefly. Um, the program does come in to work with the community to deliver some training. We work closely with the district health management teams and um, mobilizing communities. The ETS, the Emergency Transport Scheme Riders, and the custodians who look after the transport of the, the vehicles nominated by the community themselves, that is really important. That there is wider community engaged in the discussions about how to access the vehicles, community stewardship, um, who has the right to use the vehicles and when, it must be the community to set these rules and responsibilities. So that key message as well then, that the transport being managed by the community, it's, it's also the maintenance, the safekeeping and the responsible usage is also community run and managed. We worked with existing structures instead of trying to impose new ones. Um, so for example, neighborhood health committees um, were involved in the process. They actually had loads of great suggestions about coming up with demonstration rides to introduce the emergency transport scheme to the community. Um, because especially the bicycle ambulances, they're looking a little bit different. So to try and sensitize community, give people a chance to try them and get more familiar. And the DHMTs, the district health management teams, involved in them in all aspects as well. So the community themselves, but also the government support structures and Ministry of Health. So bringing them along for the initial needs assessment work and for the ongoing monitoring and the review activities. So the training, I'll just quickly move through this, but um, the rider training would include the role of an ETS volunteer, encouraging people to share stories, um, recording trips and logbooks, safe lifting and handling of pregnant women, patient confidentiality, basic principles of the ETS maintenance, physically how to dismantle and assemble, particularly the bicycle ambulances, safe lifting techniques, I've already mentioned that. Um, oxen being well cared for, um, being well cared for, there's quite a lot of um, complexities in that as well, making sure that they're vaccinated, screened, that they are procured locally to prevent um, diseases by bringing animals from other parts of the country. And then developing community action plans as well. And again, very much over to the community there for what, what their suggestions, what did they want to see. So they came up with the ideas of general community meetings, the demonstration rides, and also the building of the shelters as well. 
um, which they took uh, very seriously and is helping prolong the life of the IMTs as well. So moving to the next slide. So what were some of the results? Well, in terms of taking a quite a participatory approach to this program, we actually saw that it also started to build co um, community cohesion as well. Um, I mean, on a practical level, we've got communities now who can access transport when they need it. Um, feedback from communities and the district health management team suggests that the emergency transport scheme is highly valued. Interestingly, the emergency transport riders have increased social status in their communities as well, who are recognized and appreciated. We have um, stories from, from uh, Chama in the northeast um, of Zambia, where even though it's a non-monetary scheme and volunteers give up their own time and efforts, um, we saw during harvest that many other community members would, for example, go and cultivate the land of the volunteer riders as a sort of compensation for the time that they're giving up to help their communities. And again, these were things that the community suggested to try and make the whole approach more sustainable. Um, so we've just got a quote from one of the emergency transport scheme riders here on the right. Even if they come at 1 a.m., they will find the bicycle ambulance here. We saw the maternal danger signs, and we know that the bicycle ambulances have reduced maternal deaths. What motivates me is that I can reduce maternal deaths in my community. Uh, my next result slides, um, these are some of the, the figures emerging from the program. Between September 2014 and June 2016, 3,649 pregnant women um, have benefited and used the ETS. 91% were for normal deliveries and 9% had a maternal complication. And this is really interesting. In a lot of other programs, we've had higher percentages that were actually for complications. But I think what we see here is that communities, rural communities, have a considerable reliance on the emergency transport scheme for emergencies and non-emergencies. And an emerging picture where actually the, the transport was also being used for ANC, for PNC, for vaccinations for children. So what started off as a, an intervention designed for emergencies has, has really evolved. And again, up to the community how they want to manage that. Um, okay, my slides have jumped. Um, so we saw that women were able to rely on the emergency transport scheme 24-7, um, with 41% of the recorded transfers happening at night, which is also really important because even if the emergency transport might be there at a, um, a health facility, will it be available with um, somebody to, to operate the transport day and night? Um, I just want to pick out another figure, um, which I think is particularly important. The percentage of women delivering at a health facility increased from 64% at baseline to 89% at end line. And I think that, that you know, in this, just over two years, that's quite a striking difference, really. Um, and it was a very robust end line survey and triangulated with Ministry of Health data, the HMIS as well. So we saw some really encouraging and positive response. That is not just because of the emergency transport scheme. It was also part of a whole community engagement and empowerment approach around the safe mother, motherhood groups. But certainly the transport had a key a key part in achieving those results. Um, this is a photograph of um, two mothers with their newborn babies. This, um, we also have um, a colleague, Kenny, from um, Disicare here, showing his, his product and meeting some of the community, which is also really important. Um, the local artisans who are producing these bicycle ambulances, taking time for them to see their product in the community, to get that feedback. I think far too many programs do not share those learnings with actually the wider range of people involved. And so that was a, a really positive aspect as well. And then there's just a couple of um, quotes on the, on the screen there as well. Um, we don't have too much time, so I'll just move on to the next slide. Some of the key lessons learned. Um, as Gina and Tony have already shared, community participation is vital. Um, speaking to the community, understanding what is likely to work, what will be sustainable, what are the cultural preferences, or what are some of the barriers. Um, the, in this case, an emergency transport scheme, but whatever transport intervention it might be, needs to be suitable for the terrain, culturally appropriate, and easy and available to maintain. We need to ensure that the spare parts are readily available, and this is also part of the ethos of trying to source and construct locally. We found that trying to link some of um, saving schemes or income generating activities um, could also help finance repairs. I don't have time to get into the detail of that today, but that was an important part of the program as well. Um, also, working with oxen or any animal pulled carts um, can be quite challenging. Um, sourcing and transporting oxen 
to interventional sites, um, providing vaccinations and ongoing care of livestock. And so again, we, we work closely with the local vets office there um, so that when the program is gone, there's also the communities are, are able to um, continue to work um, with the people who have the knowledge on the ground. And my last slide really on some policy implications then, some of our key message is here, is that the referral gap between the communities and facilities need to be addressed. Um, we find that in the rural areas and particularly here, we are focusing on access for maternal health services and for newborn children. The voice of the rural um, women and children particularly, it needs to be heard, we need to share these voices further. And the message that's coming out for us for ministries of health and governments is that specific budgeted activities need to be implemented. This needs to be acknowledged in the health policy and strategy. Normally transport is just dealt with otherwise up to district level and not beyond. Um, replacement costs for ETS vehicles should be considered in national or district health budgets. A focal point we also felt was needed within the Ministry of Health for all activities that help strengthen the community health system, including community-based emergency transport schemes, um, and the importance of avoiding procurement of inappropriate um, vehicles. Um, government departments and development partners should also use locally appropriate and evidence-based um, emergency transport solutions. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Caroline. So um, to kick off the Q&A segment of today's uh, webinar, I'd like to ask a question to each of our panelists. So Tony, um, I'd like to start with you, and I wondered if you could elaborate on how new technology, such as mobile technology, uh, makes road and transport research more accessible and more participatory for local communities. Okay, thank you, Helen. <clears throat> well, the very fact that um, some people out there might be actually um, uh, involved in this webinar on their mobiles shows how technology has, um, has enabled us to actually sh share information <clears throat> far, far, more, far, far more than we, uh, than we could in the past. Um, and there are impacts I think, in terms of research. Um, first of all, one of the problems that researchers always have is, um, is getting data which is accurate. Um, because clearly the quality of the data has a huge impact on the results of the research and on the interventions and uh, solutions that uh, might uh, be derived from those results. So um, it seems to me that there are two, two aspects which have been, I, 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 should, I suspect there are lots of examples of how mobile phone technology can help benefit us. But I'm just going just gonna to talk about a couple which, uh, which, uh, which uh, have occurred to me immediately. Um, one of the things about researchers, as I say, is getting quality data from, uh, from, um, uh, tri from trials, for example, uh, in engineering and demonstration and research projects. So very often what happens is the local research center will send out a team uh, on site and they will uh, uh, conduct uh, investigations, taking physical measurements on the, on the road pavement. What very often happens, of course, is that, uh, that uh, inevitably some results show up questions um, and you get some anomalous results which, um, uh, from measurements which are made on site. And very often you don't know um, what the significance of these are. Are they just errors in the data or are they the true uh, changes that you, uh, are very often unexpected changes because these are research trials after all. And very often you don't know these until the team gets back to the, um, to, to the, to the headquarters. Um, and sometimes not even until it gets uh, written up in reports, in which case it's too late to do anything about it. What has changed in terms of uh, mobile phone technology is that you can have daily links with the technicians on site. So if there is an anomalous uh, uh, um, data uh, thrown up, then you can ask immediately for additional uh, measurements to, uh, to be taken to actually confirm what is happening. That's just one from a research perspective. Also, communities, of course, it also gives um, uh, opportunities for much more active participation uh, in, in, um, in the data that's being collected in surveys, for example. Um, 
in my experience, people's recollection of, uh, of how long journeys took or, or how distance they traveled uh, are very unreliable. And of course, the longer between the event and the actual interview that's taking place, then the more, uh, the more, these, uh, the more unreliable these responses become. And I, I found this when I was doing roadside interviews uh, even in the UK. So what mobile technology gives us is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity to conduct these interviews uh, remotely immediately after uh, the activity has occurred. Now, given uh, the, the best, the best, the best uh, results are always going to be obtained from, in my view, from direct interviews. But of course, uh, and, and there are serious constraints, as pointed out by Gina, in terms of dealing with children and people like me or the elderly, which surely might not be so good. But but there are, but there are. But mobile te phone technology does give us the opportunity to have more immediate contact uh, with respondents. Um, and there's a future exciting prospect as well, is that by combining phone technology and satellite uh, technology as well, and GPS technology, that we can now track the movements of phones <coughs> um, um, in a live situation so that you can know very, very accurately, as it's actually happening um, in cooperation with the, with the local respondent, to actually, so that we can track the phone, so you can get exact information on, on, on how long it's been taken in various, in various modes of transport, how far people walked, how long they waited for, for public transport or whatever, and then, and then how difficult it was, and you can get a far more accurate picture. So these are just a few examples. But mobile phone technology is clearly uh, going to help us get more accurate data in the future. Great, thanks very much, Tony. Um, so now, Gina, I have a question, um, question for you because you discussed many of the issues around um, engaging children in, um, in your presentation. So are there any specific issues associated with engaging women in communities? Uh, yes, um, it can be really difficult to reach uh, women uh, when you first start to work in communities. Over time, of course, you can build trust and, and you can begin to, to learn a great deal. But um, initially, very often in communities, well, women are busy. They've got children to look after. They've got a livelihood to make, they've got to collect water, firewood, and so on. So uh, think about how you're going to um, be able to, to get information uh, from them. And maybe you're going to have to go again. This is when walking with people is really useful, walking with women to find out some of those issues. Um, you may, of course, also be in a cultural context where women are not expected to speak out at all or maybe in seclusion. And again, then you need to think carefully about how you're going to get access to, uh, to those women. Uh, and it may be, of course, that you need women researchers to go into uh, the, the um, secluded compound or whatever. Um, there's also just that issue of shyness that for a lot of women, they've not been asked. They will say, when we've talked with women, they say, you know, nobody's ever asked me about this before. Nobody has ever asked me about anything. Um, and, and it is quite liberating to be asked and to be, to, to be uh, able to give your, uh, to talk about your experiences. Um, so, it, it, that also can be, can be very important. It, it, it is this, it's the whole thing of building trust so that women then feel able to, to talk. Of course, they may have had very little experience of using public transport or motor transport. Um, and a lot of the experience will be about walking, uh, maybe about waiting many hours though for transport. And it's taking the time to, to build up an understanding. Um, sometimes, of course, they have bad experiences that people have, they've 
they've been at meetings, big group meetings, where you know the women have been asked to say what they think or what they need, what their experiences have been, and uh, essentially nothing happens, nothing changes. So um, it, it, it's they begin to to lose hope. So when you get um, research which has works. Uh, moves forward and there is action, of course, uh, that's always going to help improve things for the future. And I think peer research is very useful if you're getting children talking to children, women talking to, chil to women, other women, and in a community and building from there. Girls often are particularly difficult to reach, of course, because uh, for young people are expected to be seen, not heard and uh, young girls especially. And again, working with peer research, we found really, really helpful in beginning to understand things like girls being harassed by taxi drivers, fear of biting dogs, that sort of thing. Um, they wouldn't have told the external researchers who they see, they see these as city people very often, although our work was in collaboration with local universities. It's very often many years, even if they came from a rural area, that the, uh, the university researcher has actually lived in a rural area. And rural women and girls may see them as very different and think that they just won't understand. So working from a peer research uh, approach can really help um, uh, move things forward. I think that's probably, um, well, you can talk more if, if other people have got anything further to, um, to ask about that. Thanks, Tina. It's very interesting. Um, so, Caroline, um, our question for you is, how does TransAid see active action participation research? Thanks very much, Anne. Um, well, I think the, I'll answer this in, in, in four parts, if that's okay, um, but be quite, quite brief with my answers. Um, I think the first one is it's vital. Um, I think all this has really come out from all of the presentations. It's just vital to involve the communities, the people who, who use the transport, to, to determine the most appropriate um, and sustainable solutions, and to do this in a sort of a genuine way where you create the space to listen, um, have the humility to to redesign your approach, have the, the confidence to go back to government partners or the donors um, and, and insist on this and insist on the reasons for the change, um, which I think we, we're not all often great at doing. Um, so sort of resisting that, that pressure as well, even when, when programs are, are designed, and I'm, I'm talking specifically ones that, come, that are externally funded, um, often we, we, we all know we have to create um, work plans and these need to be costed um, as part of, of proposals for funding. We, we need to um, propose a set of indicators and, and targets for those. But I think it is really important to create the space in the design of such a, such a program where we can genuinely incorporate the user perspective as part of that. Um, and as part of doing the um, active action and research, it, it's also, as Gina said, doing this in an in appropriate way. Um, for example, if we're designing an emergency transport scheme where the primary users and the target groups are, are pregnant women, um, we want to understand the travel patterns of, of women, the, the types of transport they're comfortable to use um, that respond to their needs. And these may be very different than what somebody from the, the outside may, may think is important. Um, and therefore, to do this with the correct approaches, um, so that, for example, we, we speak to women in, in women-only focus groups, um, where there may not be, be husbands or men there, um, or, or headmen in the village where, where people might not be comfortable to share, share their challenges, or why they delay, or why they don't travel to health facilities. Um, so, for, for example, um, I mean, I focused today on Zambia, but in our, our a program we're running in um, in Adamawa State in northeast Nigeria, um, we we worked with um, with university students and we worked with women who who come from Adamawa, who live in Adamawa, um, 
and, and trained them to do the formative research um, to help design the emergency transport scheme there as well um, because obviously women um, be much more comfortable opening up and as Gina said the importance really of, of building that trust so we can really understand what some of the issues are not what we think the issues are. Um, also importantly the way that, that we approach um, making sure we try and um, do this research up front, implement a program, and then really measure the change and involve the community in the measurement of that change. So, for example, in Zambia, we have a community monitoring system where the community members, um, it's only the, the minimum data set, um, so it's not too much of a burden, but so that on a monthly basis, um, there is some reporting that is done by the community. Um, tracking a few of the indicators which they also helped develop were most important to them. So, and what was really interesting about that is we found um, in the areas where we had the community monitoring system and where we had the emergency transport schemes, we saw much higher retention rates of um, the volunteers. Um, and we, 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 we do feel that this is, is also in part of making, of actually having an, an active role for the community in the measurement um, in the, in the ongoing measurement and the final evaluation of um, this transport intervention. So the retention rates of volunteers after two years there was 95% um, compared to some of the control, um, the control um, districts. And, and that was very interesting. So in, instead of what could be perceived as an additional burden, actually we found that particularly a lot of the women that we were working with were, because they were had the the feedback about the change that they've made in the community and the difference, um, and, and because the time we've taken to, to share that and consolidate it, then that was actually very motivating and quite empowering as well. So I think that's something we we also neglect to do often as um, as, as development partners. And I, I very much like Gina's presentation of showing um, the presentation in, in Tanzania of the older people's research to the minister. And that's so important as well, and um, that we take these findings and um, that actually we can create platforms for the for these the people who have been involved in such research to share it themselves with the minister or whoever it might be. So I think that that is um, measuring the change as well and um, and disseminating it effectively um, is is really critical. Thanks, Caroline. Um, that was a, a great um, and insightful uh, response. Uh, so now I have a question open to all panelists. Um, how do we take community-based research and translate that into information that is seen and heard by governments and donors? And uh, I'm not sure who would like to begin. Caroline, perhaps, um, perhaps you'd like to, um, to start with this, um, this question. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's essential that we do. I think that any of this research, um, an important, rich research that's being done, um, can be packaged in such a way that can be heard by, yeah, by governments and, and donors alike. Um, last Thursday in, in Zambia, we held a dissemination event where we um, invited government um, and a range of, of donors as well to, to share the experiences. And um, I think, you know, those sort of workshops can be can be effective. Um, what was great is we had um, some of the emergency transport scheme volunteer riders. Um, one particularly um, active woman called Esther Piri, who's um, taken many women to health facilities. She stood up at the front of 150 people through the aid of a, of a translator, and she told her story. And she explained what motivates her to do this for her community. Um, she explained why she does this, um, how much long she intends to continue it for, and she answered um, you know, questions from the group. So um, I think that these are some of the forms that can, that, where it can be done, um, bringing the diff um, you know, interesting voices and, and actually the voices from the people that know um, to just different forums. We need to make sure otherwise that things are packaged um, clearly, succinctly, that we produce um, evidence briefs or key messages to policymakers that are not too long and too wordy. We need, you know, of course we need the evidence and the data there, but we need to find ways to package this too for, for busy policymakers or, or busy managers so we can share that round. Um, and obviously through the internet as well. So I mean I think there are many ways that, that we need to share this information, but mostly importantly make sure it goes to to the right people um, and so the action can be taken so it's not just um, sitting there gathering dust. 
And I think we need to be quite innovative in the ways that we do that too. Uh, Tony and, and Gina, um, it would be great to hear your, your thoughts on this as well. Tony, um, um, what's, your, what's your response to this question? Well, yes, I, I, I totally agree with what Caroline says. And it's been a constant battle. I mean, I've been in, in research for over 50 years. <laughs> and getting research into practice has become a battle. Um, like I said in my presentation, I think, it is becoming better. Um, and the research centers that are being established uh, and some have been in operation in Africa for many years, of course, and elsewhere. Uh, but the new research centers being established uh, give us uh, an opportunity where, 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 where things can happen which demonstrate uh, the impacts that we're having, and whether it's the ambulances, uh, as described by Caroline, or, or, or the other the transport services approach uh, uh, talked about by Gina. Um, I think there is a change in attitude. And the research centers, as I say, certainly in engineering projects, allow us to actually demonstrate what can be done. And then the feedback from that is additional pressure on government um, to actually acknowledge that this can make an impact. And of course, if you get the local politicians involved, then they, they are very, very keen to actually show that improvements in their particular parts of the, of the country uh, uh, are giving benefits to local populations. It drives them; they're more likely to be elected. But they're also likely, more likely, to put pressure on governments to actually uh, uh, to, to show other regions that um, that this is the way forward. So I think the research centres, in a way, are keen, uh, uh, are key, sorry, to get um, um, research implemented. And of course, communities also. If you want to demonstrate to some villages what can be done, then this gets around quite quickly. And then this, such, such approaches are also then community driven because people say, well, you did this in the village down the road. Why can't you do it for us? So I think things are changing. And it is becoming, hopefully, uh, far easier uh, uh, to actually implement the results of research, and which has been a major challenge in the past. <clears throat> Gina, I also wanted to, to open that question up to you and um, to hear your insights into that. Well, I, th I think Caroline and, and Tony have, have more or less said it. I mean, I think um, just, uh, I suppose, a few little additions. I think the power of numbers still is really um, very considerable that if you've got you, if you can show that that something impacts on a lot of people um, it does seem to help get things moving and therefore often community-based research is very localized and it's the, it's scaling it up um, that's really key which is why we use community-based research research as a as a base then for building much larger research studies and big surveys specifically with the with the hope that this will enable us to um, be to get attention from government and donors um, I think the, uh, another point I suppose is that in some areas we've got a lot of evidence and the prime example would be gender we know a lot about the issues that women face um, in rural communities across low-income countries and yet it's very difficult to get any real change in policy and and practice um, in ac across the board and of course that's why recap has got uh, a currently uh, commissioned research program where people are trying to find out where gender uh, evidence has changed things and where it isn't and how you can improve that process of moving from good research evidence to good policy and good practice. Thanks. Thanks, Gina, and thanks to you all for, um, for contributing to, to, to that question. Um, so we've been receiving a lot of questions from the audience. So I'll start with um, a question that we received about road, um, road funds, which have been increasing a great deal, but how do we make them incorporate basic access concepts. 
So an example is given, um, many projects are over-designed. So how do we incorporate specifically designed roads to meet local needs? Is that one for me? Uh, absolutely, go ahead and, um, <laughs> and, and um, respond to that, Tony. Um, well, yes, it is a point. And I, I, think the, I think the point I made also in my presentation is that we need, <clears throat> we need local designs and specifications to, to be focused on local needs. And, and certainly, you know, maybe engineers would, say, would, would, would perhaps not accept that roads are always over-designed. Um, but certainly what we are doing and what has been the results of research uh, um, in being found from results of research in recent years is that we can be more flexible. We can make more use of the local materials and we can uh, have designs more appropriate uh, for the function of local roads so that, so that we, can, we can make the case for, for providing improved access for rural communities uh, by, by implementing the research. And as I, I know I'm repeating myself, but the fact that we can put these results of research much more easily into revised documentation and update documentation because it's now in digitized format, we can, we can update it more frequently, then this is likely to have a big impact on more appropriate designs and more appropriate use of local materials. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, we also just received a question about political will, which I believe this has been touched on um, already, but um, how important would you say research is compared to missing political commitment to <laughs> adequate, adequately maintain the existing road network? And I wonder if, um, Gina, you'd like to, to begin with that question. Sorry, can you just repeat that? Yes, of course. Um, so, uh, how important is research compared to missing political commitment to adequately maintain the existing road network? Uh -huh. <laughs> Political will is crucial, but I suppose the key thing is to get re p politicians to appreciate the research findings that are available and to and 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 to to encourage them to use that data to help shape uh, interventions. I suppose the difficulty is that for politicians, very often, uh, they need to be seen to be doing things which um, uh, improve life for their political constituency. And uh, it's only often with very uh, immediate uh, interventions that immediately impact on that particular community uh, that things will go forward. I think it is really difficult because it's a, the argument that's made so often is that you can have all this evidence, but polit politicians are dealing with immediate issues and it's at whatever fits uh, as a, a, a reasonably easy, cheap immediate response, the best impact for minimum uh, effort, you could say. That's a very cynical view, I suppose, but it is one that's got a lot of currency. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so another question that's come in is, what types of tools do we have for life cycle costing? So thinking through all phases of funding of rural roads. Caroline, would you like to um, to answer this this one? Oh, I think that might need an engineer. <laughs> I presume <laughs> that's looking at the um, life cycle of the roads. Um, so probably Tony is better place. We're we're working more on the transport services, not the infrastructure side. Um, if I've understood the correct the question correctly. That that's absolutely fine, Tony. Would you like to um, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I got the question. Um, well, there are tools being developed. Of course, for higher order roads, there are, there are tools, as I'm sure the, the, uh, the questioner is aware, like um, the Highway Design and Maintenance Model, HDM, uh, uh, developed initially by the World Bank. But that's for, mainly for higher order roads. But there, are, there have been results. I got a feeling the TRL produced a simple spreadsheet 
uh, which allowed, uh, uh, which enabled you to actually, actually make a rough calculation on the, on the likely life cycle costs. Because things are changing. You know what's happening in some countries, I think Kenya is one, the good gravel is being depleted quite rapidly. So what happens is you, you tend to use uh, poorer gravel and then, and then obviously the road deteriorates more quickly. So the cycle of deterioration and maintenance is becoming ever more frequent. So or the need for maintenance is becoming ever uh, more frequent and that really raises costs. And this is why in terms of low cost servicings and so on developed to research, it's becoming increasingly uh, um, uh, cost effective uh, in economic terms. Uh, to seal roads at a at much uh, lower uh, traffic uh, uh, threshold. So, you know, these are, these are some ways in which uh, this can be improved. And I, like I said, I have a feeling in one report, research report, uh, um, I've seen, um, I've seen a, a simple spreadsheet being developed to enable you to, have a, to get a handle on life cycle costs. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I, I think we've got time for one more question. And one that's just come in is, um, what is the difference between community engagement and participation? Caroline, would you, would you like to begin with this one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Helen. I just saw that question coming in, and, and it's a good one. I mean, there's a lot of words we're using here, participation, engagement, empowerment. Um, I think, you know, for me, and this is just my personal response, I think, you know, the participation in of, of the user perspectives um, in any research is absolutely vital. And, and I think that's, that's where we're talking really about the sort of um, participatory um, methods, um, actually you know, speaking to the community, speaking to the users, and doing that in appropriate ways. Um, from the, the practitioner perspective, um, we're probably talking a bit more um, using language such as community engagement and community empowerment in the types of approaches that are put in place. Um, so that in the implementing or the intervention um, activities to ensure that they are owned by the community, that there is the, the engagement there, and, and, and after all that the approach is empowering and it's in design. Um, so that's how, that's how I would sort of um, assess the different nuances um, from the practitioner perspective. Thanks. We've actually had another question come in um, for, for you, Caroline. Uh, was there room to consider motorbikes as an alternative in the case study that you, that you discussed in your presentation? So as yes. an alternative, not, not sure. a replacement for the bicycle ambulances, uh, now that motorbikes are ubiquitous. Sure, um, and I've, I've tried to respond to that, um, typing away <laughs> frantically as well. Um, yes, absolutely. Actually, more mammas um, was, the, was phase two. And during mammas, the first program, we did also trial some boats and some, um, and some motorcycle ambulance as well using a sidecar. In the very remote, deep, and rural parts of Zambia where we are working, um, we actually found it, and sadly, um, because I'm a, a big champion of using the motorcycle um, for rural access, um, but sadly, in, in the particular areas we were working, we found that the running costs, the fuel, and the maintenance were a real challenge um, for the communities to manage themselves um, or for the district health management teams to carve out that budget. Um, so that was something we, we did struggle with um, and we actually saw higher levels of utilization for the intermediate modes of transport that were based at the communities. So that's why in the More Mamas program we actually focused on the ox carts and the bicycle ambulances. We, we, we are you know, operating in very sort of rural Zambia. However, um, I think absolutely motorcycles are really, you know, growing and have fully emerged as a, as a really important way for people to, to access health services, education, livelihoods, um, particularly in rural Africa where most of, most of our work is, for example. So um, in Uganda, in Nigeria, we're very much using that approach and working with the motorcycle taxis and the border borders and the unions. Um, so I, I think the, the point to that is, is we, we started by looking at what was there and talking to communities about what transport exists and what's available day and night. Um, and if there were motorcycles operating um, in the areas where, where we're working, but you're, you're quite right, they are starting to emerge, but um, not, not full penetration in, in rural, um, rural Zambia and all parts yet at the moment. But give it a few years and they'll be there, I'm sure. 
<laughs> Thanks, Caroline. We've also received a question uh, for Tony. Do you think that do you not think that the establishment and sustenance, at least in the medium term, so plus or minus ten years, of regional road research centres is the key to engendering local involvement in and ownership of research outputs? So those that are likely to lead to more cost-effective and sustainable development of rural road infrastructure and transport services. Oh, thank you. Well, I was just starting to read <laughs> to type a response uh, to Mike. Yes, indeed, and and, and I think the, the there is a big difference in in the performance of road research centres uh, in the past. I mean, you don't necessarily need an old research road research centre, but you need some something within uh, within government uh, that actually sustains uh, research. That's the important thing. It could be a research center, preferably, but it could be just a group uh, or, 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 or a component of the existing structure. Um, certainly, in terms of embryonic research centers, uh, it is very, very important to, to, to give support, and that's been done under the RECAP program. And also that existing centres, which for some reason haven't developed as they should have done, and clearly support is, is important for these too. Because in terms of sustainability, unless they are shown to be uh, productive, then they won't get future funding. And what we want to avoid is a cycle of, of poor performance, less funding, poor performance, less funding, where in the past uh, um, research centres have, have disappeared because they haven't been effective. So I think it is important that we give uh, research centres support until they get to, 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 to a point where they are fully independent and fully functional. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to thanks to all of you for um, for all those responses. It was um, very insightful. And we, um, perhaps we could just have one quick round of kind of last words. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to hand it over to. Um, to, to all three of you, to Caroline, Gina, and, and Tony, for maybe your key call to action for the development community. So just kind of keeping it brief, in a nutshell, what's, um, what's, your, what's your call to action? What's your message um, that you'd like to be the takeaway of this session? Gina, would you, would you like to start with this? OK, thanks. I think above all, think carefully plan carefully before you start to intervene anywhere uh, so that you really have understood local context. Local context is absolutely crucial. Thanks. And Caroline? I mean, I think Gina summarized it perfectly. Um, <laughs> yes, really understand the issues. Make sure you do the local context. Listen to the people who are best placed, um, and and gather the evidence. Um, and Gina's quite right. With getting the data, getting the evidence, that's that's the way that we're we're going to be able to to really see the change um, and scale up and and get you know get people to take this research seriously as well to see that it is robust um, to value both quantitative and qualitative research um, and to try and get the, um, the governments, the, the policy makers to, to make the change. Thank you. And finally, Tony, your key call to action. Well, I certainly endorse um, everything that Caroline and Gina have said. Um, certainly, the key thing is support research, do what we can to get research undertaken because it does pay. It pay it comes to, sometimes it takes some time for it, for it to go from, for it, to get the research completed and implemented, which is a very often a difficult stage, but it's worthwhile in the end, and there are plenty of examples international, internationally to show that it is. Thanks. That's great. So um, thank you all so much. Uh, but I'm afraid we've come to the end of our scheduled time for, for this webinar. But um, thank you for joining us today, and we really hope that you enjoyed the conversation. There was a lot of activity on Twitter during the discussion, so be sure to follow and join the conversation using, using the hashtag, hashtag DevWebinar. And if we weren't able to answer your question today, please do feel free to submit them um, by email to webinars at devx.com, and we'll do our best to have your questions answered. And if you want to watch the webinar again, we'll be emailing it to you next week 
and posting it on devx.com. So look out for that in the near future. There will also be a survey for our audience immediately after the webinar finishes. So um, keep, uh, yeah, keep a look out for that. And again, I'd like to thank our presenters for taking the time to speak with us today. On behalf of DevEx, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And I hope you'll join us for our next online event. Thank you.